We wish to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land. We acknowledge the waterways, the land, the sky, and all who inhabit this country. To hundreds of different nations across this continent, we pay our respects to their elders, present and future. We would like to extend that respect to the Aboriginal people as we acknowledge their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this country. Hello ladies and gentlemen, a warm and green afternoon to everyone and welcome to the biggest advocacy driven beauty pageant in the country. This is Miss Earth Australia 2022. I am Nicole Wilson, your current Miss Water Australia from 2021 and your host for today. I would like to start by thanking our sponsors this afternoon, Megaworld International and Hyatt Regency Sydney for bringing in the second batch of our national finalists to discuss their advocacies about the environment. And of course, Megaworld International is headed by the ever energetic Miss Liz Angelis, the Vice President for Asia and Pacific Three. Thank you very much for all of your support. To all the viewers who are watching us on the official Miss Earth Australia Facebook or YouTube pages, Thank you for joining us today and please feel free to contribute to the conversation by entering your questions, comments and support for the contestants in the comment section. Yesterday we had our first batch of finalists discuss about endangered species. This afternoon we have a new set of national finalists who will be here to do their environmental talk on wildlife displacement. Wildlife displacement occurs when natural habitats are no longer suitable for a species. We have seen this most recently with the koalas in Australia. Today we'll go over what causes wildlife displacement and how to combat it. So without waiting any longer, let's bring in our, our contestants. So we'll start with Sheridan. Hi everybody, my name is Sheridan Mortlock and my advocacy this year is based on the acronym ACE, Action, Care and Education. These three pillars are what I believe will drive substantial and sustainable action towards the fight to preserve our planet. Thank you, Sheridan. I love the acronym. And our next contestant, Judith. Hi, my name is Judith. I'm 21 years old. My advocacy is Beauty with a Purpose. And I believe that beauty is not only based on what's on the outside, but stems from having a purpose. And my purpose is to make the world a better place and just make our planet more livable for the future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. And our third contestant, Mariah. Hi there, my name is Mariah and my advocacy is Beauty for a Cause, um, which I think is amazing. Um, I really love the environment. I've always lived on the beach and I've always seen the effects of, you know, wastage on the environment. So I think that's something really amazing that we're getting behind this year. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I live on the beach as well, so I love that. And now our final contestant, Ariel. 
Hello everybody, my name is Ariel Beninka from Brisbane, Queensland, and I'm advocating for political change for climate change, as well as spreading awareness on the impact of animal agriculture. Thank you. Amazing. So we'll get into our environmental talk now. So the first question I have for everyone, we can just go through one by one, is what is wildlife displacement to you? And what do you think is the biggest contributor? Um, Sheridan, wow. you <laughs> Um, so wildlife displacement is the displacement of wildlife from their natural habitats. So as mentioned before, we've seen this with the koalas, um, where their natural homes are being destroyed for many reasons, whether it be for building houses or for coal mines, anything sort of expansive like that. And um, so it's super important that we try to minimise that as much as possible because Australia is home to some very unique and beautiful animals. But unfortunately, we're also one of the worst countries when it comes to preserving our animals, especially in large factor due to the displacement of them. Thank you. Wildlife displacement. Wildlife displacement is a displacement of wildlife due to habitat destruction, and there's two main contributors to this. The first is clearing natural habitat for animal agriculture purposes, which is actually the biggest cause of rainforest deforestation in the world, and 80% of our world's species live in the rainforest. And the other is man-made climate change, which causes worsening flooding and bushfires, which displace wildlife from their habitat. Yeah, wildlife displacement is removing animals from their natural habitat. And I feel like not only that, they, I don't think they remove all the species from their habitat. So meaning they're going to probably build land over turtles that still live there and probably bury them alive. So they're basically killing and saying they're removing. But yeah. Um. I really agree what Judith, with what Judith was saying about the turtles and things like that. Definitely, um, yeah, wildlife displacement. Um, displacement wins when something is moved from where it is, you know. So I really think that displacement is some, in this case, animals are being forcibly moved. They wouldn't be moved if they weren't forced to by most likely us um, and clearing the land. And also um, another thing I wanted to bring up is climate change and, and sea rising levels. There's a lot of species that are really endangered at the moment on land. Um, you know, the water has risen very significantly and it might rise to about almost a meter and a half in the next like century, which is really big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And open question to anyone who wants to jump in. How do you think we can combat it? Very broad question. <laughs> I don't know where he's going, guys. <laughs> I think the best thing that we can do is vote for political representatives and government that have plans in place to address these problems. I agree with Ariel. Um, it's definitely on government legislation and them being able to put in barriers so that people can cease continuing to destroy natural habitats. Um, a lot of wildlife conservation charities in Australia, they have the funds and they have the backing, um, but unfortunately there's not much they can do about government or local council legislation, especially just at the New South Wales, or sorry, at the state level of all states. Um, if they can take a stronger stand, then they have real power over helping to preserve those little pockets that we still have left, or even to rehabilitate um, area that's already been destroyed and being able to try and bring back more species before they're completely gone. Um, I also just wanted to add that like, creating new areas for the animals is like significantly important. If something really does have to be destroyed, you know, we need to create a new area for them and it needs to be habitable. It can't just be, um, a lot of new areas have been created for animals and they're surrounded by roads and they're surrounded by lots of infrastructure that we've created. It's just not um, possible for those animals to live in that situation. You know, some animals will see a road and they won't cross it. Um, but there've been some really great strides. There've been actually some like, um, I want to say animal proof like highways where they've actually made like grass strips and things like over, but 
you know, that's not done enough. I've never seen that in Australia mm. personally. So um, we also have a question if anybody, I think this one might be for one of the other girls about the government um, in the comments. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. It'll pop up when we need to go over uh, the question. No <laughs> Um, just on what you said about um, including natural um, habitats when we actually do build new infrastructure, do you think that's the most beneficial way to do it? I've learned, I've studied it a lot at university about like green roofs and like having stops for the animals to get to. But I think there's hmm. still a lot of, uh, I guess, comes back to policies because no hmm. one's really wanting to spend that extra money if they don't have to. I mean, I really don't believe that moving an animal from its habitat is the right thing to do. Personally, like, I would not like to be moved from my home. Nobody would. That's the most horrible thing I could think of, especially when these animals have been living there for hundreds, thousands of generations. Um, it's a really big deal for them. Building, you know, green roads for them to go across is not enough. If we could you know, if we could get the government to really be on our side, be on the environment side, that would be the best thing to do. Um, personally, the ocean is something that I really care about. So obviously rising sea levels and things like that. Um, but in about 2019, about 200 countries signed a UN agreement to start protecting the ocean more. And hopefully, like, more legally binding things like this can occur to be able to create, you know, um, some legally binding things to, to protect their habitat, you know, definitely. Going off For that, sure. um, talking about creating habitats, um, I definitely believe that that has a very important place when it comes to protecting our species in Australia, just because so much of it's already been destroyed. Obviously, ideally, we want to protect what we still have. Mm. But the good thing about creating new habitats also is that there is many many invasive and introduced species um, not just animals such as foxes and cats but also um, like fauna as well different plants and herbs and all those sorts of things that have an impact on our wildlife as well and by creating our own little sanctuaries for them I guess to thrive in we can sort of have a better control on trying to keep those invasive species out so there's already lots of fences and other systems in place to try and reduce the impact of foxes and cats cats are actually a really big uh, contributor to the loss of a lot of our smaller native species that not many people know about. We all know about the koalas, for instance, but there's so many, like there's I think 80 different mammals, or no, there's 400 different mammals that are, and 80% are, of them are only in Australia. So to do our best to try and keep that under lock. So if you've got a cat, you know, try and keep it inside or get one of those bells because they just kill for fun. Um, they're one of the biggest threats. Yeah. Also adding to that, um, the, the equivalent of 1,500 football fields of land and rainforests in Australia alone are cleared per day for animal agriculture. So another thing that we can do is also reduce our consumption of animal products so that less land is cleared, which displaces animals from their natural habitat to grow more um, food for livestock and also to house the livestock. Yeah, I know you're very big on um, veganism and advocating for that. So I guess how would you promote veganism more and how are you making people more aware of the agriculture industry and the devastation it's causing? That's something I do already by making reels and TikToks and really spreading the message as much as I can on social media platforms. But it also comes back to the media actually truly representing the problem because it's a really taboo subject that the media doesn't like to cover. And it's become more broad knowledge these days, but at the start it was very taboo. And it's also on our governments to regulate the agriculture industry to do less harm to the environment. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'd also like to quickly add, there's an app that I've discovered. Actually, I just it was maybe a year ago I saw it on an ad and I found out that this app actually tells you whether animals have been tested or um, tested or if there's animal parts in the product, um, whether it's vegan or cruelty free. Mm. It's called Ralphie and I think it's really great. So if it's something that you might want to get onto or if you haven't already already, um, that could help 
you know, reduce the use of, you know, obviously hurting the animals to create the products and also using animal parts, which also hurts the animals as well. So it's spelled R-A-L-F-Y, mm. uh, P-H-Y, sorry. Okay, yeah. cool. I mean, that. It's definitely important to make those conscious decisions when purchasing products. So yeah. this is it here once you're in and you can just see like Nivea, all of the top brands like Burberry. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys can see from here yeah. a little bit. That's got Dove, yeah, yeah. so you can just click Dove and it says it's cruelty free, but it's not a vegan company. So you can see the real like stats. Yeah, that's really great. There's another app like that for fashion it's called Good On You. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a really great app. I've been using that for like eight years or something and just like continuously updating it. And that's really easy to see an overview of a, a fashion brand and seeing how good they do in different sectors, whether it be uh, environmental, human rights, animal. So that's also a good one. <laughs> I used to use a lot of like Nivea products and I literally searched it up. They're not cruelty free. They're not vegan. They do all of it. And I was, I was really surprised because they kind of brand themselves as being a very clean, mm. very clean brand. And I felt like that that would be something that they cared about, but it's every company's different. Whatever that they yeah. display is as packaging is not them as a brand until you do your research. 100%. Yeah. Greenwashing is definitely something that's become more and more on the rise recently. And for those who don't know what greenwashing is, it's basically a brand using those hot words like uh, green, eco, you know, using like natural tones in their packaging to try and portray that they're more environmental than they are. And so especially where climate change action and eco-friendly is sort of a trend these days. It's super, super important for any consumers out there. If you're wanting to be more eco, just don't take things on face value because they could just be marketing it towards that to suck you in, but they're actually a very unsustainable brand. Yeah. And not only that, they can mislead you by saying, here, buy a bottle of water for people, you know, who might be starving somewhere or, or you know, are having some really bad issues. But obviously, like, they're not looking after the they're animals they're still testing them it's not vegan and it's kind of like whilst they're doing something really amazing the products should be what are the first thing at least in my opinion if i'm purchasing from a company the product should be the first thing that is cared about first before they you know yeah go on from there More really good points which is why it's also like really hard to like promote it because most of these companies are just making money out of like furs and or and using these animals for furs and like different products and stuff which is so just social media wouldn't push exactly those um like saving the wildlife and stuff due to these money making um issues but yeah it's just starting from you we can honestly make a difference like just telling your family to look on the back of like a packet before buying it making sure it's vegan or whatever. So. It's really disheartening where, where when wearing an endangered species becomes fashionable, like having an endangered species as a bag is a token of importance, and that's just so sad to see in the world. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely seen it's getting a little bit popular, like on maybe Instagram reels or TikTok. I'll see like a lot of people bring out like a snake boots and a snake bag recently. And I'm not sure whether it's real or not, but I question it. I'm like, you know, it, yeah. it could be, even if you purchased it from like a vintage store or something, even if it's reused, you're still saying, hey, people want this product. And that sends out a pretty bad message for other people. You know, they might seek out that product to put on the shelves, which I think is, mm -hmm. you know, it's sending the wrong message in the end. And people might be encouraged to buy more of that product, which leads to more wildlife displacement because they have to catch more of those animals to turn into those products. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've just got a question from Erin. If the government could do more about this, what would be the most productive approach? Judith, do you want to have a go at it? Um, maybe just setting more laws in place, more laws in place for... <laughs> That's okay. Setting more laws in place and more regulations in place to maybe stop such like agriculture happening in like those areas and stuff. 
Yeah. Is the, this do you mean for the wildlife displacement or for the the um, animals being turned into handbags? <laughs> wildlife. You can pick one. <laughs> um, honestly, I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought you were talking. <laughs> oh no, I thought you were going to go. Um, would you like oh, to? No, so I just wanted to clarify. Before, oh, that's okay. You know, yeah, in case you get like four different answers. Um, <laughs> Personally, I think that, you know, we have a lot of heritage sites in Australia. It needs to be really cracked down on that we have wildlife sites. You know, we have a lot of botanical gardens and people go to the botanical gardens. They walk their dogs and all of that. There's the beautiful possums there that live there. But nobody is nobody's going to like, well, obviously you can't visit the wildlife sites, but nobody is knowing or seeing wildlife sites around. It's not heard about. It would be really great if we could get some really sanctioned areas. Also, mm. there really needs to be a crackdown on laws um, for mm. infrastructure being built. I know that there's been probably hundreds of new businesses or hundreds of, you know, businesses repeating themselves by going, hey, we'd like to build on this land. And then maybe not stating the truth about the wildlife that's there mm. or because there is an assessment that does go through before you're able to build on the land. And I feel like, forgive me for saying, I feel like there's a lot of lies being told. I feel like there's a lot of land that really does have a lot of very special animals there and they're not yeah. disclosing that. They're just building on the land and, and maybe lying to the government or not cracking down. It corruption, needs to be corruption is a massive problem. Like how, yeah. if, you put, if you want something done, you put someone in power that you can corrupt to get what you want. That's the yeah. sad thing. Is money drives these decisions, and you see politicians making immoral decisions and leading to habitat destruction and wildlife displacement because we don't have someone in control of this that cares, and we can easily corrupt those people. Yeah. Absolutely, um, there needs to be much more transparency around people that are able to get these pieces of land that should be preserved. The lack of transparency is allowing people to con continue to get away with the habitat destruction, especially when it came to the koalas. Like not only are the natural disasters caused by climate change, which is a big issue, we saw this with the bushfires just recently where millions of animals were killed or displaced, but also just in the everyday activities of developers and mining, there needs to be more transparency because without that, as you guys were saying, they can continue to get away with destroying more and more habitat. Yeah, and thank you so much. I could not find the word corruption in yeah. me. I don't use the word very often. It's a very strong word, and so very is lying, of course. But it, there's, I definitely believe that there's corruption there. Um, building sites, there's just too many building sites going up, too many species going missing, not enough reporting, not enough documentation or transparency, just as you said. Yeah. It all Before comes down to afterwards. Like, oops, sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't realize. <laughs> like, oh no, sorry. There's like some baby rabbits living here. It's okay. Like, oh, there's a special endangered frog species. Oh, whoops, <laughs> we cemented their <laughs> lake. Uh, but they're so small, so nobody cares about them. Yeah. <laughs> it's really just like seeing the videos online of a baby orangutan being, or like an orangutan, like literally putting its hand up to. Um, an excavator or something being like what what the hell's going on like are you i think everyone's seen a video of like, an hey, orangutan stop, what are you doing <laughs> yeah or, or like you'll see all the trees gone and just one little baby orangutan sitting there and it's like it, it, touching back to what judith said earlier like they just leave like a couple of animals there just to die like there's no food now all the everything's gone they're not yeah I think it all comes down to regulation. I know the Greens have a plan to end native forest logging, which is a great um, solution to the problem. And also they want to restore a lot of the wildlife habitat. Yeah. That would be beautiful. <laughs> I really yeah. wish that, that can happen. Honestly, I think of one day if the Greens get in power, Australia will be a utopia for all and the animals <laughs> will all be happy. And <laughs> I don't know. I think every political party has its ups, every political party has its downs. But in terms of the Greens, like advocating for that, I'm really with that. I'm with what they're saying there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sorry about the dog. I'm just going to segue into the next question and then put myself on mute. How effective do you think national parks are in protecting native wildlife? Does anyone want to jump in? Yep, I will. Um, so native parks are a great way of helping to protect native wildlife. It's a piece of land that has been sectioned off like this is our park and we know we'll protect it and we'll try our best to preserve it to the best of abilities. Um, obviously with parks, people can come in and might disturb habitat wildlife. There are obviously sanctions and rules in place for most of them and, you know, do your best to stop littering, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that they're uh, incremental, a very, a very important aspect of helping to preserve wildlife and getting people interested as well. Because if you see something with your own eyes, you know, you'll be like, you'll realise its existence, I guess, you know, like, I didn't realize what a fat tailed Dunnart was until I spoke to Sarah last year. And yeah. ever since I've been like, how many other gorgeous Australian mammals or creatures do we not know about? Yeah. So to be able to go there and experience that firsthand is definitely very significant to drive a change. People will be more passionate about it. I yeah, definitely. It, um, it comes back to. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say I definitely thought that until I discovered the noisy minor bird and I was like oh maybe you can do this. <laughs> that one's a little bit noisy actually like um, I think national parks they're pretty great at protecting wildlife but um, as I said earlier there's still you know there's still roads all around them most of the time um, there are of course like some national parks that are kind of like off the course and they have, you know, the dirt roads that lead to them and they have a pretty like extensive area around them, which is really great. But obviously, I I'm not sure how much we can trust humans in the parks to not litter, to not try and touch the animals or feed the animals or like disturb the environment. I think I would say, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say, adding to that, the national parks become tourist destinations where they get so much traffic and they become big hiking destinations for people that could disturb the wildlife. Yeah, but I love that they're, you know, I love that they're there and I love that animals mm. can have that space. Like, I'm not saying that every single animal there is disturbed. I'm sure there's hundreds of amazing animals thriving there. So that's really great. Yeah, I'm definitely for that. I would say that they're quite effective. I agree. I agree as well. And just while we're talking about good things that we can do, I'm just going to quickly give some tips on Mega World International. Uh, so our sponsor, Mega World International, have done activities that preserve the environment and create awareness with regards to wildlife displacements. And whoever will win this year, Miss Earth Australia, will be able to fly to the Philippines, the home of Miss Earth International. They will have a chance to visit the famous tropical paradise island in the Philippines, the Barokai Islands. And one of the key projects of Mega World International is also located in the Paradise Islands, the Barokai New Coast. This is a master planned township that preserves the natural beauty of Barokai and at the same time builds a sustainable community in the island. Aside from using environmentally friendly construction materials and techniques, Megaworld International has so many environmental initiatives in this project that fosters long-term preservation of the island. To name a few, the township project has its own treatment plan to prevent the waste discharge to the sea. It also uses the recycled water from the plant itself to irrigate the gardens within the community. The township has solar powered streetlights and serviced by electric vehicles. And the township has done a multiple special cleanup drive along the island, three kilometer famous coastline and has preserved hundreds of full growing trees in the community, which includes some trees listed as endangered species. So whoever wins Miss Earth Australia, maybe someone here in this group, will get to fly over there and it looks beautiful. I did Google it. So Google it if you haven't seen it already. So I'll just dive into a next question. 
Um, what are some things that should be kept in mind before choosing an area to become a wildlife conservation area? That's a good one. That's from Sarah, who was in New Earth last year. I'll start. Um, some things that should be kept in mind are definitely big, big, big one is making sure that the location is ideal for whatever animal that you're trying to implement back in. Obviously, if you're trying to have a good place for frogs, uh, somewhere dry won't really work unless that's already the natural habitat. But also a massive one is ensuring that the, the, um, the flora there is also good and it's like natural flora. They're actually more uh, foreign flora in Australia at the moment than our natural uh, <laughs> our natural species. So we need to make sure that the ones that are put in place when they're creating that uh, are going to be beneficial, not detrimental to the habitats they put in. And also, again, going back to the foxes and the cats and trying to keep those invasive species out so that they can have the best chance possible to try and regrow themselves. Yeah. And yeah. also to put that into perspective as well, like when you, you know, if you purchase a new dog, a new pet or something, you take them out in the backyard, there's a couple of different weeds there that they might eat and it could potentially kill them. So you really have to be, you know, you have to be as worried about these animals as if they were your own pet. Um, the environment, you need to check that for obviously a certain amount of time before you decide to release all these new species into an area. And also you need to be mindful of, you know, how long is it going to be before society catches up with where that location is? You know, mm. is is the infrastructure going to start moving in quickly? Is it going to take 10 years, five years? Because those are really big issues. If they're going to have to be relocated again, there's quite a high chance all those species will die out. Um, relocating has never been easy for any species, not even us. So, you know... It'd be really great if we could find a location that could be a sanctuary for a long, long time. Because I think yeah. it's, it's also yeah, important. I think, uh, sorry. I think it's also important to make sure those areas are actually protected because you see governments, they put in protected spaces and then another government comes in and just overrules that for some corrupt reason. So we want to make sure that if these areas are put in place, they stay in place no matter who's in, who's in government. Yeah. So how do you think we can balance the urban growth with the need to prevent wildlife displacement? Because urban growth is one of the biggest contributors as well as we reach further and further out into nature and take all of these places to put up houses and shopping centres. So how do you think we can balance that? I think Judith, do you want to go first? Um, maybe just, um, <laughs> not sure. It's hard. It's really hard to know how to actually incorporate it all. Uh, Ariel, sorry, I cut you off. So you were about to jump in. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think people living in apartments means that we get more population in a more condensed space. So I think we should have more of a focus on apartment buildings and having more people in a smaller space so we have more room for that wildlife. Yeah, I agree with um, yeah. Ariel as well. Sorry. <laughs> I agree with Ariel. Um, there's too much sprawl now mm. and the suburbs that we're building are a bit soulless all the mm. houses are the same there's no community it's just house after house after house and it's very desolate and it causes yeah. you to use your car more because all the shops are built elsewhere as well and so they build these massive shopping centers instead of just having a walkable a livable city so you can see in like the old days when they first started to build cities, you know, there's shops and then on top of those shops, there's the houses, there's the apartments. And that would mean that people could also drive less. And being in a more compact area means that there won't be so need to sprawl out and destroy more habitat and land. Mm. So I think that we need to focus more again on walkable and livable communities where there's little pockets instead of just sprawling out with massive houses, big driveways and just more habitat destruction. 
I completely agree. And there's so many other benefits to that because you also reduce transportation pollution, mm -hmm. which is a really big contributor as well. So like seeing livable communities with apartments and everything you need in a small um, space that you can just walk to just makes me so happy. And I would love yeah. to see more of that. Like we don't have to have that just in cities. We could have that in mm -hmm. urban areas as well. Um, I have two quick points. I was just going to say that one, personally, I live in an apartment. I just moved here a month ago. Um, and uh, it's a pet friendly apartment, which is great. But I don't think that there are many apartments really that are that pet friendly. So it would be really great if we could, you know, almost create apartments that are sort of more like homes that might have like kind of a balcony with grass or something on it that you can keep or pets. Because that would be one of the biggest driving factors for people to actually have that backyard and everything. Like a lot of people have replaced backyards with pools nowadays and things like that. I feel that pets might be quite a big driving factor and obviously wanting open space. But um, as well as that, the government might really need to take a look at the land that they're using and say, okay, look, this is where we're going with these suburbs if it keeps building out, what's it going to hit? And it needs to think about the animals. It needs to think about the animals just as if they're people and go, mm -hmm. okay, if it hits this suburb, if it hits this potential suburb um, in the next 50 years, you know, these thousands of animals are going to die. If it hits this potential suburb, maybe these hundreds of animals are going to die. So if we could build out one way and if we really have to lo relocate animals and really make that decision, it could be, you know, that they really need to make like a hard decision like that to relocate some animals in order to not kill thousands. Um, if they're not able to, you know, because we can't control how much people are moving. And yeah. It's, it's definitely a multifaceted issue. Obviously, with yeah. all things climate related, it's like dominoes or a spider's web. You twang one and it vibrates across to others. So I feel like a really great thing to do to help stop that city sprawl is uh, also like implementing better public transport, like a fast train. I know Australia has been talking about it for centuries, um, mm -hmm. but that would really help to spread out and still be able to have that space. If you have like a big family or really big dogs or something like that, to be able to have that so that you can live more outside of the city, but in specific areas that wouldn't be destructive to animal life, I think would be super beneficial. Yeah. And also going back to what you were talking about with the apartments and wanting it to be more pet friendly. Yeah. The good thing is a lot of these walkable communities and these livable communities that are planning development, um, they have big open parks because they've realised that that seriously does lead to your mental health as well. And so they were dog friendly. And just to be able to have that, honestly, it'd be my dream. Like Canberra was supposed yeah. to be that. When they were the designer, whoever it was, I forget his name, who was planning Canberra, that was his vision. And it was great. And Canberra is like super green. Like you go between suburbs and it's just forest. It's like where's the city? Like, <laughs> it's just trees, <laughs> you know? Um, so something like that to be incorporated and to stop just the sprawl would be, I think, super beneficial to stop the wildlife displacement. Yeah, 100%. Also put, like, community gardens and ecospaces yeah. on the rooftops. Like, we're not utilising yeah, apartment yeah. rooftops well enough. Get some solar yeah. panels up there. Get some gardens, yeah, you know? Well, <laughs> Why aren't we yeah. putting solar panels on the side of apartments? It should be a government regulation that all new developments have to have solar. Honestly, I think especially this is a bit of a kind of a bit of banter here, but <laughs> look, look, a lot of let's just start with the small things. Like a lot of schools have always said that they're going to build in a pool and it's taken like five years. Australia has said that or well, Victoria has said that they're going to put in the fast trains and it's taken this many years. I have an apartment building just you know 100 meters away from me I've moved in for a month and I have seen it go from stilts to massive concrete walls in the span mm -hmm. of a month and the amount of infrastructure and development that you see cranes and everything all over the city I don't believe that they're not able to get this done mm -hmm. I think it's about people needing to push there's the funding there is the funding and um yeah the the amount of infrastructure being built in Melbourne alone here in my city and also you know as all of Australia is incredible so I don't believe that they can't get this done like I just don't you know we it's, have amazing workers we have hundreds other countries have already implemented this 
Yeah. Uh, I think it was yeah. Austria has the most livable country in the world, has the most affordable housing, and they've built around livable, walkable communities with these spaces. So it's just Australia that's so behind. It's definitely money-driven, being that a lot of our income or our economy, I should say, is from major fossil fuel companies. And these houses that are popping up so quick are cutting a lot of corners. So you'll notice in a couple of years, maybe a decade or two, those new apartments that went up super quick will actually start to crumble and degenerate because they were built so quick and they were dodged, you know, dodging corners on how to do it properly, um, which is also yeah. super unsustainable because there are buildings that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years that are still very strong, but these new apartments will start to break down in a couple mm, of decades. Yeah. Australia also has the lowest energy standards for energy efficiency. So Australia's homes are not built for the weather, especially mm -hmm. in Victoria, where it gets so cold. The homes are not built to the to a high enough energy standard to have the home regulate heating. So mm -hmm. as Australians, we have to use more energy to heat and cool our homes because of that. Yeah. And not only that, I think, I don't know why, but we're sending a lot of electricity overseas and charging our own people a lot more than what we're selling it to other people. It doesn't make sense. It should cost more that it's traveling all that way. It doesn't make sense to me. Same with cattle, lots of other things. Yeah. We're really, yeah. It's because really they get more money right. sending it overseas. So they have like, well, why would we give it to our own country if we can make more sending it overseas? Definitely. Um, in regards to the apartments I mentioned, it would be really great if they could build pet friendly, you know, with grass, all of that. These big apartments, they're already being sold for millions of dollars. The projects are already costing millions and millions of dollars. Um, if they could create something like, you know, a house that you could buy for a million dollars or whatever within that apartment space, you know, you could sell all of these multi-million dollar apartments that are like homes that people will live in for a very long time instead of selling individual homes for literally so expensive nowadays as you guys have seen the market's gone up to like two million dollars for just a nice house and uh, I remember people used to be buying houses for like five hundred thousand, and you'd be able to have your big backyard and, and live you know that that wasn't that long ago that was like five ten years ago yeah, and that was so, like the Australian dream to have a home with that big backyard yeah and look honestly I still think that you can have that I don't think that there's anything wrong with having a big backyard. It's just where and how you go about it, you know. Like big backyards are still great, especially with families. It's super beneficial young kids to be playing out the backyard whenever because sometimes you can't always get to the park down the road, of course. Um, it's just super – it's definitely about where and how it's how you go about it as well as ensuring that if you have any – gardens or plants in there that it's beneficial to that native area so playing planting natives nothing that will you know destroy anything else anymore that it needs to be and native gardens also are big in like the grass lawns are super destructive they're super they just take so much water and they provide nothing back we're seeing like a natural lawn trend come back in where people are planting native grasses and it's just the sound alone like you can hear the life from it whereas the grass like picturesque lawns are just so dead <laughs> <laughs> yeah like definitely that. and we have so many native grasses here in Australia as well that we don't utilize it's crazy um we just have a question from Monique a previous Miss Earth uh the media footage of the bushfires really opened people's eyes not only nationally but internationally but some people still do not believe in climate change how can the media help address these issues such as wildlife displacement more effectively I think the media just have to keep covering it and being honest about the cause. And that's what I loved during the bushfires is the media actually were like, this is actually caused by climate change in action and how climate change is getting worse. We need to keep on top of that and keep pushing that this is the reason that this is happening. This is what it's doing. It's displacing all this natural wildlife and it's going to get worse if we don't do something. So we can't just keep denying it. We have to take action. Absolutely. And one of my pillars of my advocacy, education, it's super important that you know where your sources are coming from, because unfortunately, a lot of the media in this country is also skewed by political influence. Um, and so if you read 
any sort of article that you don't think is from a reliable source, it's super important to either reach out to a more reputable source or try and do your own research because a lot of it will try and sway public opinion so that they can get away with more things such as habitat displacement. So just critical thinking. <laughs> Especially anything owned by Rupert Murdoch. Don't trust it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say it's... You know, this this is kind of a bit of a counter moment here, but I just think it's really upsetting to me that we haven't been able to measure, you know, temperature and climate change over the last hundreds of thousands of years. A lot of people are saying, look, where are the facts? And I can tell you that um, parts of the Antarctic have actually gone up two degrees in the last hundred years. And even actually, I think Melbourne, Australia, where I am, has gone up like a whole degree in the last hundred years as well, but I can't, I can't get somebody and sh Google like you know the temperature for the last thousand years to show them like the acceleration. Um, it is projected that within the the next hundred years that um, the ocean levels will go up about a meter and a half or something like that. In incredible! It's gone up eight inches in the last hundred years. Yeah, um, and. I just wish we could, you know, get that book out and, and show somebody like all of the temperatures because it's changing. It is like it's it's accelerating. You can measure there's, the acceleration. There's the definitely. I, you can go. The way I deal with these people is firstly, you prove like, look, all these things that humans are doing are releasing excessive amount, excessive yeah. amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So once you talk to them like, okay, this is the evidence. Humans are releasing excessive amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What happens when that hap when we do that? Look at other planets that are just completely CO2 atmospheres and they are poisoned. There's no life and they're really hot. So we can see examples of what happens when there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere and we know humans are releasing so much CO2 in the atmosphere that it's changing our natural habitats. That's a really great point. Um yeah, with social and, media, the more you push it out and, like, the more people see it, I think maybe there would change. it would change people's mind and the more you speak about it, the more you would persuade other people to believe in wildlife displacement and, like, yeah. There is definitely yeah. sources and information out there, such as um, what you were saying there are graphs, there are things, but they're just not accessible to every yeah. single person. There isn't time for every single person to go through these, like, thick academic sourced, you know, articles that can be very confronting and, uh, you know, just difficult to read Actually, sometimes yeah. under the terminology. Yeah. You know? There needs to be something in place so that the media and education in countries only can tell you truthful scientific information that needs to be backed up again coming back to transparency you know the information's out there and everybody knows about climate change now whether or not they believe in it or not they know its existence the problem is that now there's so much information and misinformation out there there needs to be some sort of standard set so that only the truth and the science can be trade by things hmm. very influential people such as the media and politicians and even celebrities there needs to be that standard in place so that no more no more fake news <laughs> no fake news yeah. <laughs> we can see how to stop <laughs> that is <laughs> something that was a massive wake up call to me recently I, i'm going to admit i actually only figured this out just after i applied for miss earth but um like I, I knew a lot about the environment beforehand, but I just found this out basically the day I applied to Miss Earth. Um, I searched up carbon footprint and I didn't know what it meant at all. I, was, I kind of knew sort of about what it was, but I, I didn't really know 100%. But if you go to, you know, online and you just search up how to calculate carbon footprint, there's these really amazing sites. They'll calculate your car, your food wastage, your electricity, um, how many people live in your house, everything. And it will tell you, what your carbon footprint might be for the year. So if we're able to get everybody on the planet down to 2.5 tonnes per year, which is still a lot, but <laughs> then we will actually be able to equal out with the atmosphere and the environment. That actually is something that's possible. Um, and I'm pretty sure 
40% of all of those carbon emissions throughout the world is actually coal burning. It's, it's like, so we need to reduce our entire planet usage by about half at the moment. I think on average, everyone is about five tons or four tons per year. There's some people which are really bad. Maybe uh, some celebrities we might know with private jets, they're using approximately 10 tons a year or more. Mm-hmm. So it's it's caused by food wastage. Your food will sit there and rot, emit CO2, you know, plastics wastage, um, using your car, everything. Like, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> going I'm on just about. I'm going to jump to a question from Sarah. Sorry, we're coming close to okay, the end. <laughs> It's been made great. (laughs) Um, Okay, from Sarah, what can farmers do to make their farmland less destructive to wildlife and their habitat? Unfortunately, the answer to this one is not very ethical to the animals. You would look at like, look at cows grazing in a big field and think that's more environmentally friendly than a factory farm where all the animals are shoved together. But the truth is, even though having the cows on this big grassland grazing naturally is more ethical for the animals, it is less environmentally friendly because it takes up more land and resources. So I honestly think the best thing that we can do is to just reduce our consumption of anything relating to cows because the sheer population of cows alone is such a big impact on climate change. And there's so many ways of which they cause harm to the environment. So I I think reducing animal products is the best thing that we can do and also having governments regulate farm industry as much as we can to mitigate it. It's going on with what Ariel said. I come from a farming community. I'm a country gal, uh, Southern Riverina. Um, (laughs) Farming is, yes, uh, very destructive to the environment, but there are actually sustainable ways to farm. So I forget the name off the top of my head, but it's something like circular farming or something so you've got like four sort of sections you have your cows in one and then they go into the old fields where the crops just were and they eat that produce manure help fertilize the soil meanwhile chickens are in another one meanwhile there's something else in another one and basically what you do is you keep rotating these around because that helps to preserve the topsoil and topsoil is super important in our agriculture business. It's very, um, like without it, we, it's got all the nutrients that are needed to grow the plants and to keep the animals happy and healthy. And unfortunately, because of overuse of pesticides and dangerous chemicals that have only really just recently, like in the past you know, decades, been introduced into farming, this is severely damaged the topsoil. And we've actually got a very big topsoil problem in Australia at the moment. So... Farming itself isn't necessarily destructive. It's just that we've overconsumed now. Instead of having steak as a special treat on a Sunday, we're having it every day. So, yes, we do need to reduce our consumption of meat. Um, and we just we just need to change our farming practices as well. We need to get back to this regenerative farming now where you can actually plant native flora um, to help to, uh, you know, stop pests and to help pollinate and also even um, animals as well that are just natural pest control. We need to go back. There are already some in place, but we need to go back to that natural form when nature is helping nature and it's all connecting in a perfect little ecosystem instead of trying to chemically and, you know, sort of sterilise nature we just need to let it be so that it can do what it was intended to do which is grow and help provide for one another yeah yeah I think that's really great and it comes to down to that whole circular economy which we love (laughs) so we're getting close to the end so I'm going to ask everyone to do their closing statements so just a bit about yourself why you're doing this earth why you want to win this earth Um, I'll start with Sheridan because you're at the top of the screen (laughs) Um, So thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in today. My name is Sheridan Mortlock. I'm 22 years old. Um, I am super, super passionate about the environment. I'm studying global sustainability and politics at university right now. And I'm just got all this knowledge that I want to dispart. And I'm really hoping that through my advocacy, ACE, Action Care Education, these three pillars can really drive substantial change because without these 
we would be lost with no direction in where to go because this is such a big issue. So hopefully if I win Miss Earth Australia, together we can ace <laughs> climate conservation and protection and I'd really love to see this expand and have more people talking about it. Thank you. Uh, Ariel, you next. It's so important to protect our wildlife and Mother Earth, so we must continue to educate others and push our governments to make change, which is something I will continue to do as a part of my advocacy and as a Greens member. And I hope to be able to continue talking about this important issue to you, with you as your Miss Earth Australia. And thank you so much. I was so happy to be a, a part of this important conversation. Thank you. Yuda? Thank you for listening, guys. The more general problem is just removing animals from spaces for food or for um, money purposes, which is decreasing our wildlife and disrupting it. So just making sure we spread awareness about these issues in our environment will really go a long way. And um, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, Mariah. Um, hi, guys. My name's Mariah, and obviously I'm a contestant this year. Um, I've lived, as I said earlier, I've always lived um, near the beach until about a month ago. For about 20 years, I've lived there, seeing the effects of wastage on the environment. That's, that's what I want to take care of. There is an island of trash out in the Pacific um, with 2 billion pieces of trash just everywhere, microplastics. I'd really like to donate to that and help get rid of all of that. That, yeah, that's something that hurts my soul looking at. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for attending today. And I hope we all learned something. I know I did. I just want to do a last thank you to our sponsor, Mega World International and Liz Angeles, Vice President for Asia and the Pacific Three. And of course, to Hyatt Regency Sydney, the official residence partner of Miss Earth Australia 2022. And also to Stargazer Productions, license holder and owner of Miss Earth Australia, headed by our lovely national director, Julieta De Leon. I thank you to all our viewers for your comments and support during this live. I hope you learned something as well and you go away and really think about wildlife displacement. So please tune in next week. We will have more batches. I think there's two more and I hope you can all participate again. I can't wait to see everyone in Sydney in two weeks for the grand final. Yeah and thank you viewers as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you.